day to you wherever it is you are listening to us at this time. Uh, it's another beautiful Saturday. And we, the beautiful are starting with this on Bold TV. We are right here, ready to take you into the journey uh, where we discuss issues as it affects and concerns women and girls with disabilities in Nigeria and by extension across the world. You're welcome to today's edition of Bold TV brought to you by Bold Heart Network. If you love what we do and you would like to contribute, you would like to support the project, you can do that by reaching out to any of the hosts of the show, uh, Freki, Afiong, Abiyose, Osaki, and myself. I am Uluato Misi Adeyef, I'm your host uh, for today. And today we are talking about the prevalence of gender-based violence amongst women and girls with disabilities and a case study for today's edition and uh, some other series of the show would be a documentary that talks about uh, women with disabilities who have shared their stories of GBV, uh, that's gender-based violence and other, uh, to put it out there that, okay, these things don't just happen to women, but also women and girls with disability. My ladies are right here uh, because I wouldn't be doing this all alone. So I'll give them the opportunity to please tell us their name, uh, where you're based, what you do, and your kind of disability. Good day, everyone. I'm glad to be here. I'm Osaki Teresa George. I reside in River State, Montacourt. I'm a polio survivor. I'm into um, uh, education, is I train on my participation. Happy, happy, happy. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Bold TV. My name is Afia Oitem. I'm based in Rio. I'm a medical laboratory scientist and a spinal cord injury survivor. My name is Grace Oluwatosi Awolumate. I'm based in Ibadan. I am the founder of Hebs Rotabitsta Foundation. I'm a gospel music minister and a polio survivor. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Freki and USTN. I'm based in Port Harcourt in River State. Um, ED Faker Foundation, a member of Bold Hearts Network. Um, I use a wheelchair from spinal cord injury. Good to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you, ladies, for making it a day today as we discuss the prevalence of GBV, gender-based violence amongst women with disabilities. To start with, uh, let me put out the statistics that uh, one in every three women, you know, throughout their lifetime have had an experience of GBV. And for women and girls with disabilities, this is triple the number because first, they are women, and uh, secondly, on the basis of their disability. So uh, the disability, the gender comes together and uh, increased vulnerability for women and girls with disabilities, making them victims of GBV as well. And we need to pay attention to it because it comes with a lot of consequences, both on the woman, uh, her family, the society around her, and every other thing. And that is why we would be examining this documentary that has just been released. And uh, this documentary is that of women women with disabilities, women especially who are of marriageable ages, telling their own stories of GBV, telling their experience, sharing what they've been through and how they've been able to come out of that hole. We'll take a listen to the first story in the documentary. And when we come back, we shall start the conversation right here on Bold TV, brought to you by Bold Heart Network. Thank you for listening. My family insisted that they cannot allow me to date a Christian guy. And that was the person I love most. So because of the, um, the family pressure, I decided to go out with this person that beats me with an acid. But it's not easy for me to let the first guy go. He decided that if he cannot have me, that he would rather destroy my beauty. That if he destroy my beauty, nobody will have me. Nobody will marry me. And wish he did. Ha, 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 ha. 
<laughs> in Nigeria, women with disabilities are not just grappling with negative social stereotypes, discrimination, and stigma. Similar to their counterparts without disabilities, these women also experience grim episodes of sexual and gender-based violence that never got mentioned in news and courtrooms. According to the United Nations, one in every three women in their lifetime has had an experience relating to sexual and gender-based violence. For women with disabilities who are further down the ladder of importance, they are ten times susceptible to various forms of abuse and violation, primarily because of their gender and deepened on the basis of their disability. As it is found in the larger society, women with disabilities also embrace the silence culture for the fear of being stigmatized, abandoned, rejected, or losing favors from abuser. Investigation reveals that cases of sexual and gender-based violence reported by women with disabilities have close persons as perpetrators, such as family members, spouses, friends, and caregivers, making it more difficult for victims to speak out against abuse. Another factor debarring justice for these women is inaccessibility to information, knowing what to do, where to go, and how to get help. Even when the media are employed to raise awareness and campaign against SGBV, how inclusive are these messages for persons with disabilities? Latifat Adeleye never got justice, despite an acid bath from a jealous lover that ultimately led to a total blindness in 2011. My name is Ladifa Adeleye. I wasn't born blind. I was excited before. All led to my blindness. Someone beat me with an acid because of jealousness. Actually, we were dating. And before him, I have someone I'm going out with. But because I'm a devoted, devoted Muslim. And the other person that I'm going out with, the first person I'm going out with was a Christian. And my family insisted that they cannot allow me to date a Christian guy. And that was the person I love most. So. Because of the, um, the family pressure, I decided to go out with this person that beat me with an acid. But it's not easy for me to let the first guy go. So he decided that if he cannot, if he cannot have me, that he would rather destroy my beauty. That if he destroy my beauty, nobody we have me nobody will marry me and wish he did he destroyed my beauty on this very very two day that he beat me with an acid i was on my way going to mosque that was 30th of december year 2011 around 6 a.m i was almost at the mosque 10 I felt something cold on my face. I thought it was ice water. I was like, who is playing with me with um, ice water in this early morning? After, after I rubbed my face, I was just hearing a full step running. Maybe at my back or on my front. I cannot see. I started shouting for help nobody i did not see anybody i tried my way and turned back to our house and the mosque and our house are in the same street so when i was going on my way going home i fell i fell down and one two women came to my rescue and took me to our house People were coming out to them, pouring me honey, red oil, water, <clears throat> and so on. Before someone now suggested that they should go to this spot and go and check my 
cloth because I put on wrapper my chap, which I've thrown away. So they went to go and pick it and they saw the armless stainless cup with acid. That was when they got to know that it was an acid that the person poured on my face and I was taken to the hospital. The first general hospital that I was taken to was Iliopo General Hospital. They refer before they refer me to uh, Lassut uh, Ikecha General Hospital. The, I was taken to the hospital that very day and they were they did not allow um, they did not allow reporter or policeman, police to come and see the situation. They were just treating me as what they are giving me, not the, wasn't the first aid that they supposed to give me. Then they said they will operate me, but they did not share before I was discharged. When I was discharged, I was taken to our family house from dear my sister introduced um, a reporter to me they came and after 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 taking my report sha the the case was uh, the, the guy was arrested later so maybe after two or three months after he poured me and asked because he ran away he said he he drank a uh, ipo he started shouting his house neighbor came out and took him to the hospital from the hospital he ran away they went to go arrested his uh, senior sister when in his, when his senior sister was arrested it, it was then they now go and bring him to the police station then the police station too was at uh, they said they don't used to twist um, that kind of a uh, case there that they would not torture him the guy was taken to the uh, to party and he wrote a statement he confessed and one of his senior brother came to our house i was not around then i was on, uh, on treatment so one of his brother came around that uh, they want they want us to settle the case amicably after then they did not come again and we cannot be looking for them because they were the one that uh, they, had, uh, they were the one that uh, they were the one that need to be looking for us, not we. So when the the case was um, taken to the court, and when they show him his statement, he said he wrote it. When he got through, he said yes. The statement, uh, the statement was written by him, but he wrote it under duress. Some after maybe um after years later sha we used to go to court after at the end of the case they, they, he was discharged <clears throat> they released him then after i as in, i couldn't get myself i i felt very bad for that day and because the acid affected it touched some of my some part of my body like my breast and my arm so <clears throat> i was like so this boy said i will not see anybody that will marry me and he, he truly destroyed me <clears throat> if you see my former picture this is my former picture this is before i look at uh, now look at me now but i thank god that god is at my back now i'm married and i have a kid <laughs> would love to reopen the case in court, seeking the face of justice. Latifat, with so much disbelief in the nation's justice system, rather prefers to move on with her life, especially now that she has got a family of her own. Welcome back. It's still Bold TV, brought to you by Bold Hat Network, and the ladies and myself are here, ready to discuss what we've just listened to. And uh, to start with, I must say it is a pathetic, uh, really pathetic story right there for Latifat Adeleye, who wasn't born with a disability, but got a disability as a result of being a victim of GBV. 
and then you know we heard how she's been able to come out of that fold in our own way so ladies let's start what would you say was your first thought when you 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 watched latifat adelaide shared a story so very quickly grace i want you to share your views what what was your first thought what came to your mind first okay so at first i i was heartbroken because you know i've been hearing of gender-based violence and it was my first time seeing that i've only been hearing of it so i i was heartbroken because at that time i felt she was really helpless you know when you are helpless and you get hurt in the process i felt i felt bad and on my own side i i would, I would say i felt i felt she was cheated yes so that's my own um idea of that my own opinion about it i just wanted to feel our call so that uh, people at home will know that while they are feeling uh what the way they are feeling we are also not left in that uh, out in that kind of feeling that they are feeling right now because i feel it's really a pathetic uh story okay. right there okay so afion please go ahead when i first um watched the video i think my first impression was um frustration it was, I felt frustrated because, you know, it felt like she was set up a whole, um, a, a group of, a bundle of um, factors, you know, set her up, you know, to make her a victim. I felt frustrated from the stereotype, you know, you know, so the preconceived notions, you know, the failure of the support system. I felt frustrated on her behalf. Mm. Because if maybe one of those factors had even so, been in place, I think she would have stood a better chance. When I saw this story, I just saw wickedness. I mean, I felt really, really anger. What's this? So I just felt that um, the man involved, that uh, the, the guy that, that just said about her parents' uh, consent, that what the man did was really wickedness and dehumanizing. But, because of if he does not marry her, no other person. So that was really, I was really sad and so much anger. I felt when the man was totally wrong. And that kind of thing should not happen to any, anybody, no, no matter the uh, situation. And she was really helpless to see how she can solve the problem. Thank you. So for me, I felt that um, there was a lot of failure on the part of everybody she was i felt that i felt bad because the system failed her every it was like everybody just failed her and i felt really bad that somebody who had even tried to get justice had been failed so much and so i i, I think I, I just felt very bad that you know you say silence is not golden and then here is a lady who has even tried yet everyone society government everything around her kind of failed her so i don't i felt really bad about the whole um situation okay, okay. so um now that we've expressed our first thought uh which is the first uh impulse we had listening and watching latif share our own story of gbp right there it is important to identify factors, angles that you know contributed to ensure that uh, this that has happened happened. And we are doing this in order to prevent, or more like you know, um, use this as a con point of contact to other women out there, including and women and girls with disabilities, who may want to toe this line or who may find themselves in such a situation and you know this would in turn help them navigate through and also seek uh, and get help as much as possible so let's identify those factors those you know things that contributed uh, to what latifat adele had uh, experienced in terms of gdp uh, that we just watched right there. All right, thank you very much. So for me, I think one of the things that struck me about the story and will also you know, push the agenda of involvement of all when it comes to gender-based violence prevention, 
and you know pre and prevention of gender based violence is that we have seen that disability can be a cause and a consequence of gender based violence because we don't always really see that you know cycle as seeing that gbv can be the cause of disability and that gender-based violence can be aggravated because of disability. And this story is a clear example of how we cannot have the conversation of gender-based violence without discussing how the interaction of disability comes into, into play. So this story shows us that GBV is both a cause and, um, sorry, disability can be a cause or a consequence of, you know, of gender-based violence. And then as for the factors that aggravated you know, this for her, we see that the perpetrator of abuse in the case of Latifat, as we've always said, was someone that she knew. Usually an intimate partner, usually somebody in the inner circle. And for this case, it was somebody that she held in great trust that she had maybe decided, that she had decided to give her heart to. So we've seen that a, a, a close factor or is to understand that perpetrators of abuse most times are not necessarily strangers. Um, another one I see is that she was pushed into a relationship that she didn't want to go into in the first place. And this happens a lot where parental consent is not given or parental um, insistence comes up a lot of times when the female child is involved when it comes to relationship because all of these factors played a, a role in going down that road that led to where you know the the acts you know and then the consequence there which is her being in blind i'll stop there but there's more i can come back later yeah thank you very much for that one and i love the fact that uh, we realized from what you said that uh, disability can be a cause can aggravate or be a consequence of gender-based violence. It's a very, very good point to note right there. Osaki, tell us what, what were your highlights from this experience of Latifat Adelaide? Okay, thank you very much. One of the highlights I'll say is uh, sentiment. You know, as in, because she married the guy out of sentiment, as in out of sentiment, she wants to be the guy just to please her parents. In situations like that, I just look at it as you use your head and your heart because these kind of things, the man knows that, okay, he's marrying me out of sentiment. And if she wants to live on her own, I, I, I talked about her story. She still felt the love she had for the other. So somehow, maybe um, there's this. Um, sensing of that or that love, and he wants to make sure that nothing for her as everything ends just with him and her so he has to do whatever he did and you know I, I just felt that we should have this um sense of like a kind of weird certain move stylish move so i strongly believe uh there, there will be a way out for her to escape but she didn't sense it on time all she realized was just the heat of the acid on her and that was too quick so I just felt that in an interstitial of that kind, if you have yeah, this sense, this um, kind of love and your head, don't, don't be total with emotion, but try and see how you can manage both of them, being sensible in um, intimate relationships or those kinds. Because most times they are not strangers, they are close partners. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asa. For that one sentiment sentiment <laughs> if, if we really dive into that uh, word sentiment uh there will be a lot of angles to it because i mean like frankie rightly pointed out there uh she had the influence of her parents uh, and you know in this part of the world the parents are the alpha and the omega you know they, they hold and play huge roles in the child in the life of any child especially if you still have them with you even when they are no longer on earth you know, you have a way of remembering their words and then you just want to stick to it uh, by being a good child and all of that. So, Grace, what were your highlights? What, what were the factors you were able to pick? What were those things that for you contributed uh, to this incident that we have right here? Okay, so for me, she, okay, let me just say this. She became a person's disability um, under the threat of gender-based violence. Like she wasn't a person with disability. 
but somehow she became one because she was threatened. So that's to say that gender-based violence is, is more than what we can see. That is just one of the damages it can cause. That is gender-based violence can cause. And the fact that she was denied one of, her, one of her major human rights, that is the freedom to make a choice and to, to make her own choice. Her, her parents for me in this case were, were not fair. Were not, they were not fair on their own side. If they had allowed her to make her own choice and, and given her the opportunity, I, I think this wouldn't have been what we'd be saying now. So I think the fact that they denied her, her one of her major um, human rights, it's, it's not fair on the side of the parents. Thank you very much. All right. Um, thank you very much for that one. And then, you know, when you talked about the human, uh, one of the human rights, uh, to choice, it reminded me of uh, the World Health Organization Sexual Rights 2012, and one of the highlights in that uh, regulation stipulates that anybody has the right to choose whoever they want to uh, get married or have a sexual relationship or intimate relationship, whichever one you want to call it, with. Uh, right there and that's to say that this is not just in nigeria here this is something that the whole world recognizes afion tell us what are the factors that you think contributed to what we have latifa latifa adelaide experience in that video i think I'll, I'll just give you two one of those is religious bias religion mm. played a role in this because if there were, you know, there was no bias based on religion, I believe she would have been able to decide or make the, you know, make the decision of who she, she wanted to be in a relationship with. Her first relationship, the one she wanted, was not permitted based on religion. So religious bias also contributed. When Osaki mentioned sentiment, that was one of the, you know, sentimental aspects of this um, issue. And then mm -hmm. secondly, economic empowerment. If she was economically empowered, I believe she would have been able to, she would have had more of a say. Because when a woman is empowered, she, she had decision-making abilities are also enhanced. She has more of a say in the decisions concerning herself and those around her. So because I believe since she was still dependent on her parents and you know, she was not uh, empowered economically, that also contributed. So she didn't have, she couldn't make decisions about what happened in her life as she was more or less independent. Wow, thank you very much. Uh, economic empowerment, a religious bias, and uh, those were very huge factors. Now, all these factors, I would like our women out there to take note, to take very uh, good cognizance of it all so that we are able to prevent occurrences such as this that we had to deal with. I have those out to Latifa Tadile and we are uh, so much standing with her and standing by her through this. We know she's, you know, risen above it, but trust me, uh, some telltale signs of uh, the trauma that experience created uh, still lives on. And we are standing with and by her right here on Bo TV. Now, what significant uh, thing for me in all of this is access to justice. Now, if women without disability would, uh, you know, experience a uh, uh, draggy kind of justice or you know not even get justice at all when these things happen to them some of them don't even know where to go how to get help and all of that. and i would want to, as uh, ladies right here to talk about access to justice especially for women and girls with disabilities when they experience uh, any form of gender-based violence i think first and foremost for any woman who has um, faced gen um, experienced gender-based violence, especially for women and girls with disability, the first thing to do would be to, you know, get that experience documented. Talk to someone, someone you can trust, someone who would be willing to listen. Then get information about there are many groups, support groups, and. Um, um, how do I say, private organizations that deal with these things, you know, like 
uh, FIDA, where you can get free legal aid to help you get information about them, get the um, experience documented as soon as possible. And this would actually be after probably, like let's say for the, in the case of maybe someone who was um, raped, if you have documents sure that you know, immediately after the experience, whatever happens, get to a hospital, get treatment and let every process be documented so that there is evidence to show. And where that person, the person who has, you know, inflicted this injury is someone that is known. Share, you know, the history that you have with this person so that everybody knows how, you know, where it started and how it got to the point where it is. And most often, you know, in cases like this, the family will try to dissuade the person because of, you know, image, to protect the image of the family. But in such a situation, I think I would advise if any woman is undergoing that, find somebody outside of the family that you can relate your story to, who will not pressure you, you know, to try and give up on seeking justice. In her own case, you know, somebody was able to help her, you know, at least get her story documented, which was at least some evidence in the event that she would want to pursue it. And that could also draw the support of the public to help us see that she gets justice. So documentation of the experience is very important. Okay, I, for me, I think the first thing they should do is to speak out. So speaking out would give you the opportunity to get help. Because when you keep things like that to yourself, you don't get anybody to help you. And this is something I know um, women with disability, you know, they want to endure, they want to, um, like other women, they want they don't want to leave maybe, let's say their husband's house or things like that. So they don't, or some assume no, no one would listen to them. So I would advise you speak out at every given opportunity. You are asked how you're feeling, please speak out. Before we go ahead with that, uh, let's recognize one of us who just uh, joined in the conversation. Abiyose, kindly very quickly introduce yourself. Tell us where you are based, what you do, and uh, your kind of disability. Thank you, Tommy. My name is Abiyose Faladi. I'm the executive director of Angel Wings Global Freedom Foundation. I'm a, I'm a writer. I'm the author of the book, Name is a Warrior Girl. Um, nice to be here. I live in Ibadan and I use a wheelchair. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. So, oh, um, Abia said, before I come back to you, uh, let uh, Frankie share our thoughts very quickly on this one while you gather your own thoughts. I want to speak to the story as the case study in responding mm. um, the question. When you look at the story of Latifa, you will see that the initial interaction that she had was family when family she ran back home after she didn't know exactly what happened for that investigation of her hijab and her rapper showed that it was acid when they found the stainless steel cup that way that it was not a palm oil and home remedy case so they took her to the hospital why am I going like this? Because what Latifa did is correct. What the family did was correct. Getting medical help in the case of GBV, GBV as an immediate response is key, not just for the case itself, but for the victims or the survivors, because we don't like the word victim, for the survivor's help. In her case, it was, an, it was a case of acid acid being poured on her face. For another person, it could be a case of rape, just laughing and mentioned. So a health, immediate health intervention is key, especially in the case of physical violence, which is what we saw in this story, or sexual violence as it were. So they did the right thing of going to the hospital. Now, my concern in access to health, sorry, I'm not doing justice first, is this, I think and I believe that in the fight of gender-based violence, we must continue to engage institutions because the intervention or prevention of GBV is multi-sectoral. It cannot only be on the um, survivor's um, uh, point of view, 
but also has to be intervention that is strategized from different sectors. Number one, health. So where they failed her in the first place was that the first place she went to did not know first aid as a response to um, acid pouring. And then they had to now refer her to a tertiary institution. This actually should not be so. Our primary healthcare systems, or in our case, she went to general hospital, so secondary healthcare should have been able to provide that immediate first aid that she needed to curb any um, um, health effects of that, um, of that um, acid bath. So I just wanted to point that out that systems have a major role in playing. Secondly, and she actually said it, when they knew that it was an acid bath, they should have taken a statement in the hospital. They didn't need to get to the police station. That was a service that should have been provided for her. So just as it is that if a person is shot with a gun, they want a, normally in the hospital, they say before we treat you, we want a police statement. It should have been that a police would have been brought in because she did not bath herself acid, would have been brought in at that stage. So why am I saying this? Because if a person faces this, you can actually ask that please bring the police here. Lafayette has mentioned documentation, so that the documentation can come with the evidence of a, um, a skilled or a professional, a health professional to say, indeed, this is what it is. And that's the first, that's it. I'm just using her story specifically. Now, the next step, which was that they kept for a bit too long and that he needed a reporter to now bring the story and then he now got the police involved. So almost immediately the police should be involved in, in the um, documentation of, um, of what's happening. And I do not remember hearing that her statement was taken. I only remember hearing that the statement of the young man was taken when he was taken into police custody. So I think that they should have ensured that she also gave her statement so that it would not be a case of he said, she said, they said. So documentation, appropriate documentation key. And why you must know this is so that you can demand it from the systems because this is the procedures that they should take. So health and then getting documentation of the experience. So making her statement, he made his statement. Also, also the next thing I want to state is this. She said she wasn't around when a family member from the man's side came to try to settle out of court. They should never, you never have those kind of conversations without third party witnessing because they can deny those kind of statements. I feel and I know that Latif's case was she had enough to be able to gain justice. But maybe the reason why they could circumvent justice was because a lot of the things was done a bit informally. So sometimes you would need a lot of things to be done formally. Nobody should come to you and say, let's set out of court and there's no witness to that you know, testament. And rightly so, in assessing a lawyer, a lawyer with experience is key. Either you get a human rights lawyer or somebody who is an activist in that area of gender-based violence. And like I've said, FIDA is a good place to get um, legal aid, bon um, what do you call it, pro bono. All right, thank you very much uh, for that one. And then, you know, uh, the video uh, went on to say that she was asked if she would really love to, open the, to reopen the case. And then she said, no, that uh, it was an experience she didn't want to go through again. And then the fact that she doesn't have that much belief in the Nigerian justice system any longer. Wow, such a huge one right there, if you ask me. So Abiyase, uh, very quickly, because uh, we need to start rounding up the session. Uh, tell us, what are those steps from this story that you've listened and watched uh, of Latifat Adeleye that you can suggest to a woman uh, out there, either with a disability or without a disability, going through any form of GP at this time. Thank you very much. First and foremost, according to Latifa's story, that her parents didn't want her to, to date a Christian. First and foremost, she should have listened first. And then when the man became obsessive, she should have spoken to her, one of her family members. Another thing I think she needs is that she needs to heal emotionally. And if, like Freki said, if she really wants this case reopened, it can't be because there are 
vivid and clear evidence that this was this happened to her. She was scarred for life. Yeah, and I learned that any woman who feels that her life is being threatened should not take it lightly. She should talk. She should voice it out as soon as possible before things get deadly, because things can get deadly pretty fast. Um, thank you very much, Abiyose, for that one. So rounding up, ladies, uh, let's share a final thought on this and our advice going forward as it concerns uh, the issues around PDB and women and girls with disabilities. So, Chris, let's add your final word. Okay, like I mentioned earlier, I said speak out and then um, look out for where to get solutions to this problem. Don't just stay there and feel you can feel you can fix things yourself. And then don't, um, like I, I said before, I said disability doesn't make you less human. You have every other right, like you have the right, like just like every other person. So please make use of those rights you have. Thank you. Most acts of violence in any form often build up. It always starts somewhere. It's not just somebody doesn't just, you know, decide to attack you one day. There's often a build up to it. So for women and girls with disability, don't normalize any behavior you're uncomfortable with. Have boundaries. Don't normalize somebody comes today, shoves you, maybe pushes a finger and you think it's normal. You tolerate that next and the person will move from one finger to five fingers. You keep tolerating that next and the person will use their whole weight against you. So it always be, there is a build up to violence. The person does not outrightly attack, especially if it's somebody you trust. They build up to it. So take note of those things. Don't make excuses for them. Don't excuse any act of any negative act, anything you're not uncomfortable. Speak out and tell the person you are not comfortable with this. You don't like it. And then secondly, acknowledge that you have been wronged. Do not try to make excuses for the other person. Acknowledge you have been, regardless of what anybody, whether family or friends say, acknowledge, say, tell yourself what was done to me was not right. Acknowledge how you feel about it. Cry if you have to, but acknowledge that this, what was done to you was not right. And then ask yourself, what do I want to do about it? So don't just accept whatever happens to you and say, oh, if only this. Don't make excuses for the other person. Nobody deserves to be treated that way. So acknowledge what was wrong. And if you then the choice remains with you, if you want to pursue justice, go for it. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. But if you choose to move on, one thing you will take note of is that if you, you know, ignore it and move on, then you have set a precedent as well. I know it's not easy to pursue justice, but remember that what you do will have a, you know, an effect, a snowballing effect for those, any other person who may experience it. So go as far as you can. But don't just keep quiet about it. There are always signs before this violence starts. They don't just start like, um, as Chunk has said, they don't just start, they start one finger. But I believe they start with verbal words first before they go to fingers. They start with words, testing words on you, testing words on your psyche. Those are red flags. The minute you start hearing these words, my sisters, please step back and reevaluate whether you want to stay. In fact, there's no reevaluation other than you leave. Don't, don't like Afyong said, don't entertain any kind of abuse of any kind whatsoever. And um, make sure that you also value yourself. Self-worth is important when it comes to this. Know who you are and understand who you are. Accept who you are. That way you will know that. Thank you. Silence is not golden. Don't be quiet. Try and watch over every verbal abuse and body language. Don't take any of them lightly and take them as a joke. For most of the start with jokes. Thank you. There's no excuse for gender based violence. While I was listening to Latif's story, you know. I, I, within my head, I was just imagining how persons would probably blame the fact that maybe she was not committed to the relationship. 
and maybe she was still hung up on the other guy. So the other one was jealous and acted out, you know, I was territorial and acted out his jealousy. Really, well, all that may be stories that touch. There is no excuse to be a perpetrator of any form of gender-based violence. The other thing that I want to say is to our systems, you cannot continue to fail women. You cannot continue to fail women with disabilities. It's time for access to justice to really be access to justice, not just for some people, but for all. It's time for access to health to be inclusive. It's time for our systems to really defend us. I mean, we have um, policies, we have laws, but here we are, she actually did speak up, but then our systems failed her by giving, not giving her justice. A young man who bathed a young lady in her prime in acid was acquitted by a law in the country. All right, thank you very much. As far as you can, don't keep quiet about it. Nobody deserves uh, to be in a position they are not comfortable with. We all want to be comfortable with convenient so we should be all about our comfortability and fitness in us. So we've come to this um first part in a series on the prevalence of gender-based violence um, among women with disabilities, the documentary. Um, our host Tommy Sen was thrown out of the call, but we have had a robust conversation where we shared the first story which was focused on the young lady Latifa. We are hoping that the conversations that we've had today have resonated with you in one way or the other, whether you are a woman with disability or whether you are a family of a woman with disability or a provider of one service or the other. We'll be bringing this series in um, three parts. This is the first part. And um, the second part will come up later in the month and the third part in the month of uh, May, among other episodes. Bold TV is brought to you by Bold Hearts Network. And today I've had Grace, I've had Osaki, I've had Afion, I've had Biose, and myself, Reki, and the host, Tomi Sin, bring our conversation today. Please, if you want to support us, we're still available to receive your support. Bold TV comes to you every Saturday by 10.30 a.m. on www.facebook.com forward slash Bold Hearts Network, or you can visit us on our new, brand new YouTube channel, Bold TV. So until we come to you next week, same time, um, same uh, same station, same place. Be good and protect um, others as well. So ladies, unmute yourselves and say au revoir. Au revoir. <laughs>